Hello, and thank you to episode number... 60, thank you to six, the episode number? I don't know. 68. This is episode 68 of the Carmargent Show, part of the Haggerty Podcast, Podcast Network. Network. I'm finally, how many episodes are we into this? Uh, today, we're going to talk about hot hotches. Yes, specifically yeah. the Toyota Corolla GR. Grr. Grr. Girk and Gurry. Yes, the Corolla and the Yaris. Because you have driven the GR Yaris, Mm -hmm. and I have driven the GR Corolla. Mm -hmm. And we have both owned a number of front-wheel drive cars. But I've never owned an all-wheel drive car. Does that disqualify me from commenting? No. Yeah, probably not. Definitely not, because you've driven plenty of them. Not after the terrible things I did on track in the GR Corolla. That was fun. Um, Okay, so this is that time where we do the whole... You, you have to do it. No. Please. You did it already. Let's see what Mine says 9.53. Mine does not. As always, Derek, you are ahead of me. I am persistently punctual. Yeah, yeah. You got to put it over the, <laughs> over the hoodie. <laughs> you know, it's not actually cold outside it's just that no I, it's just freezing in here uh, well it's because i put the air conditioning at 68 who knew that it would become <laughs> who cold knew that it would go to 68 <laughs> not just over the ear but over the hoodie <laughs> should we do the whole episode <laughs> like this we may have to i'll turn it back up i'll turn it to 78 meanwhile palace no, still no, screwing no, with the 78 then we're no i think that's my usual thing so it's 78 when we're doing podcast and then at 60 eight when i need to cool off when we're filming revelations because it's always hot out there so huh. i have to walk in and like uh, cool off for a couple minutes um, in the ice chamber in the ice chamber slash changing room slash whatever this is <clears throat> podcast studio podcast studio hmm. haggerty podcast <laughs> network studio there it's look re- i did it oh we already did that shit yeah you did we <laughs> <laughs> reminder <laughs> you've already done what you think we haven't done yet but guess what you haven't done yet um w- yes so the last episode you did it twice. I watched it last night. Oh, really? Yeah, we're stupid. I mean, funny. <clears throat> we talked all about the roof. The roof. That was on fire. Incompetent boobs. <laughs> that was brought up. Apparently, I did refer By to other people. Portia, the PR person yeah. was like... He was like, I laughed out loud when you called all the other, other journalists incompetent boobs. And I thought, oh no, what did I say? And I had to go back and watch it because I mm-hmm. you know, have no control over my mouth. Well, at least you got a compliment of your memories out of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> this episode is not about memories. Uh, it's not? No. Okay. Thank God. Um, this episode is about grr. Gazoo racing. Gazoo. You pronounced it correctly. Everyone else wants to call it gazoo because it's uh, spelled it like looks kazoo. like kazoo. Yeah. I didn't know that was how it was pronounced. Gazoo? Yeah. But it is. It's gazoo racing. Okay. Oh, um, we're learning things already. Mm-hmm. Entire minutes into the past uh, podcast, whatever. The, the, it might thing. be half, <laughs> might be hours into the podcast because you know we have to do the intro after we're done recording this, and right. so we don't. You know, we're probably also both jet lagged, and it's very, it's very dry in here. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. We are not. This episode in, is not about memories, and it's not sponsored by Nivea Intense Healing. But uh, I feel like I'm ashy. <laughs> okay well welcome <laughs> thank you uh, i'll put this away so anyway we both drove gers yes different gers and we have not talked about them uh, you drove ger yaris because you were in europia yes and interesting drove- to see who buys those cars i mean the two i interacted with two of them one of them i did not drive the other i did drive one is owned by signore power slide lover mm-hmm. power slide lover um and his of course had his dent in the fender for some reason <laughs> Because he uh, power under slid into a, <laughs> into Italian, a snow right? bank. Is he Italian or Swiss? Uh, he's Italian. He's Italian. Uh, and then <clears throat> I drove um, one that is owned by Mr. Betty, who own, who is the founder of Chimera Automobili. Uh, and so that's what both of them have as sort of their daily runaround cars, which tells you, I think, a little bit about the type of car that the Yaris GR is. Especially after last week's insert of... Uh, I That was the first time I saw your hell ride in that camera <laughs> he was not messing around oh yes <laughs> holy shit yes we were not hanging around that's true um so oh, yes, wow people, much louder is it yes oh, you were adjusted i was not oh well Paolo's touching our sliders while we uh while we talk 
Um, I do need lotion. Do it's not. Right. Yes. <laughs> Ew. I do. <laughs> <laughs> it took Paolo a couple seconds. Uh, I'm just going to let have, let's have that a moment breathe of silence for, for the Carmudgeon <laughs> show, which is now canceled. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, staying on point, uh, no one knows who the Corolla GR buyer, uh, GR Corolla buyer, is yet because it's not on sale yet. Uh, is that true around the world? Uh, Corolla is a U.S. product. So it will go oh, to U.S. Only? and Australia. Yeah, really? U.S., Canada, and Australia. Yeah. Really? Yeah, the the deal was, remember, with Yaris, it's got that turbocharged three-cylinder, the 1.6-liter three-cylinder that was federalized for Europe. Um, and so they could bring this homologation. So we should, we'll go into that car. But the Yaris isn't sold here. So in order for Toyota to sell it here, they would have not only had to homologate the engine, but also the entire car, right. which means crash and everything else. And there's just no way. All to sell a tiny shoe car that wouldn't sell in the United States anyway. Exactly. Uh, so Toyota wisely made decided to just bring the Corolla, put that engine and four-wheel drive system in the Corolla, sell it here. It's a bit heavier. I think it's 380 pounds or something. Um, non-trivial difference. Non-trivial, but they gave it more horsepower. So it's 300 horsepower here. And it has back doors. And it has back doors and back seats, unless you get the... Uh, Morizo. Well, I call it Chorizo because it's easier to remember, but Morizo edition. Um, uh, and the Corolla's already on set. So it's nice, good-looking car. The regular Corolla, um, obviously the GR is more spectacular looking. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so tell me about your Gur Yaris, Esperienza. Uh, Esperienza. Uh, it was good. I, I really enjoyed the car. It actually made me think that is when the Corolla version comes to the US that I might have to sell my GTI and buy that. I really enjoyed it. It was a I used it in one context only, which was on a road that is normally used for hill or is hi, not normally used for hill climbs. It is abnormally used for hill climbs. Normally, it is a public road, which it was when I was using it. Uh, but they run a hill climb up that road to, if that to tell you anything about that road, which is that it's narrow and technical and twisty and uh, just exactly the kind of road that you and I would most enjoy. Uh, and in that context, it was brilliant. It was absolutely just awesome. It made me laugh and giggle and smile and do all the things that a good driver's car should. I like three-cylinder noises much more than four-cylinder noises. Uh, it just and it's it's the right-sized car that loves to be at ten tenths or eleven tenths. What was it like at ten tenths? What did it do? Uh, it was not. It didn't feel like front-wheel drivey at all. It felt just sort of natural and seamless and ro very rotatey, happy to rotate, adjustable. Mm. It was a just a gratifying car. I never found myself. Are you getting? Oh, you're getting thermally. You're, you sound very different when when you're not speaking to a microphone. I'm so awkwardly sorry. I just I'm not that cold. Anyway, uh, uh, sorry. I was cold. I'm actually not. You're cold closer either. to the air conditioner. I'm, I'm also right, fine. Now you're going to see I'm, how different I sound. Don't I sound different? Uh, now the, I'm back. Oh yes, <laughs> I sound different too. <laughs> Deafening. Um, so you yeah. turn your volume down so no one can hear you. Just flap your lips and. Yes, it'll be a, the best performing episode ever because <laughs> no one will be able to hear what I'm saying. Uh, no, I, I really enjoyed the car. It was a good car to just hustle on a back road, right? Enough suspension travel, good ground clearance, all of the things that normally make, for example, a supercar in that context not any fun. Uh, all of that went away. All the reasons why we love hot hatches, but without so much of a front wheel drive character. So it's kind of the best of, of both worlds. Motor was talkative. Yeah. 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 Reasonably so. Yeah. I mean, by modern standards, certainly more so than like um, a Mark 7. That's right. going to be the reference point I keep referring back to because it is the hot hatch with which I have the most experience. Right. So that's interesting that your experience with, with Yaris was just on a twisty back road because my experience with Corolla was just on a racetrack. And I don't, frankly don't think Toyota did themselves all that much of a favor the way they did this press trip. So it was in uh, Salt Lake City. It was at uh, Utah Motorsports Campus, formerly known as Barber. Um, <clears throat> and they had uh, half the track was for GR Corolla, half the track was for new manual Supra. Um, hmm. And that really didn't do Corolla any favors because you hop out of Corolla and you hop into a rear-wheel drive six-cylinder. With, with a manual. With a manual, and it's just... It's a rear-wheel drive sports car versus a front-wheel drive-based hatchback. So that didn't put it in the best light. But also, uh, it was at five or 6,000 feet of elevation. Mm -hmm. And so turbocharged cars can typically compensate for that elevation. and Once still, they're boosting. Once they're boosting. And so this thing was so dead off boost. Um, and it was laggy and not really responsive. And that's really difficult to... 
workaround on the street. So they didn't really have a street drive. We weren't a lot off off the, the property. Why did but they do that? I don't know. But there was a there were roads around that were uh, what their explanation was that the roads around were just straight and terrible. But there then I would say don't do a press launch of a hot hatch somewhere that's at elevation with straight roads. But the that's track fair. track was okay. Um, but there was a road around the track and they set up a couple cone courses, you know, like you could just kind of do what you needed to do. And we were told not to go over 80 miles an hour. And then I got screamed at for doing 60. So it was just a little bit, you know, short leash. Fuck. Right. Um, but so I, I did a bunch of starts. Out, did you like, just get someone fired at Toyota PR? No, the Toyota PR. Let me, let me, let me actually say, because it did sound, I was beating them up. They have been probably the most responsive, helpful car company um, for me since I started at Haggerty. I mean, Icons was two years late to the Super Game and they just loaded up anything I wanted. They brought cars out of their museum for Texas that we could drive and include in that episode. They did the same for me for GR Corolla. They got me a re- uh, GR86. Uh, they got me a really early car so that I could get Icons done by the time the embargo expired, which is a month earlier than everyone else. Um, they really unbelievably responsive and helpful and they are interested in quality and they want like a thoughtful review. And even though I wasn't really all that nice to Supra, they still talk about it. They're like, no, you were totally fair. It was, you know, it's fine. So they were, I love them. I just don't think this particular location put the car in its best light. Mm -hmm. Um, So overall, I mean, on a racetrack, holy shit, is this thing good? It's competent. And (laughs) the big Mm, surprise. That's an interesting word. Competent. Because I noticed that you did not use the word fun. It was fun by virtue. And I'll find an insert to, to do this because a bunch of people were n- nice enough to video me doing really stupid shit. Stability control light is flashing. I don't think that means <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> My lunch, dude. <laughs> Put on That's adaptive cruise control. Yep, adaptive cruise control. There we go. Flick it in. And Give it some, baby. Woo. Give it the beans. Too beautiful. They're doing a nice like Patty LaBelle. Um, you can you can grab the car by the scruff of its neck and do things to it that you would never be able to do in any sports car. You can Scandinavian flick it into a corner, and if you did that in a Super, for example, you would <laughs> enter the corner it. backwards. Yeah. I mean, it, this thing is just so forgiving, and when it, you when you sort of behave and drive it cleanly it's very competent it's so fast around corners and in transitions you feel body roll and it leans a bit um, but it doesn't slow you down um what it doesn't do is light your hair on fire and be stupid and that was to me a disappointment a car that looks this way and has a triple you know three cylinder in it i kind of wanted genuine you want every car to be unhinged though what is the most unhinged modern car fiat 500 odd what about the uh, I mean, Veloster GR, N? GR, yeah, I was going to say that next. GR86 is pretty unhinged in the handling department. I mean, that thing, everything you do throws it sideways and then it laughs at you while you're like, yeah. It's, um, but Veloster N is the hot hatch with the most personality that's on sale today. It just got canceled. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Fiat 500 R Breath, you started, had no muffler. That's also um, not available anymore. Not available anymore. But that's the sort of level of silliness and sense theater of drama theater, right yeah you kind of want from a you know golf r's big failing has always been that it's just doesn't look any it, special yeah it's too audi like it's too adult it's too german right. too serious and it's a car that you can commute in but it's never going to make you laugh the i thought that the gr would make me laugh especially given the reviews of the yaris gr mm-hmm. which you know everyone was a bit sideways but mm-hmm. i went back and watched everyone's review and the sideways stuff and they were always on the wet they were mm-hmm. never in the dry um, so Corolla will not get sideways under power. Um, I tried everything. First gear donuts. I tried, I went into a parking lot to see what I can do. Cause now I want to go write a script and do an icons episode on this car. And so I sort of like, okay, I need to understand the repertoire of what this car, the, 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 the full, I should say envelope of what I'll be able to do for stunt driving. Not much. Mm-hmm. Um, so now we're going to try to find a gravel. <laughs> we're doing it in the wet. Well, how do, where can you go to guarantee that you're wet? I can go somewhere where I can guarantee it's going to be gravel and dirt. <laughs> the California Highway Patrol has this thing called the skid pan. And it's like a track with curbs like this around the whole mm-hmm. side. And then they have sprinklers. And then just turn it on and fill the whole thing up with one or two inches of water. And you can slip and slide around. But it's at the CHP Academy in Sacramento. 
I mean, I could do that. The problem is if I go near CHP, they will look at my driving record and be like, you are not coming near CHP unless you're in handcuffs. Yes. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I, I, I'm really torn. So the interesting thing about this car is coming in the U.S. in three trim levels. You have Core and then Circuit, Circuit and then Chorizo. And Core and Circuit are, can be spec'd mechanically identically the same. Core's base, uh, Circuit gets a carbon fiber roof um, and then limited slip and bigger brakes but you can option those on on the base model then there's the more all of those things huh you can option it all up to that you can't mm. option you can't get the roof yeah on okay. but then there's marizo and marizo is pretty wild i can't so they're only selling i think 200 of these in the u.s so you're talking really rare they're gonna be a hundred grand or something absurd Fifty one thousand bucks msrp yes right? but once they get adm'd or secondary marketed i'm sure that stupid stuff like that will happen totally but this is the problem. It's the best one because mm. <laughs> they put a new gear set in it. And I don't mean just to limit its lip. Uh, so final just a drive. final drive. They put a shorter final gear drive ratios, but then had to modify first to be longer because it was too short. And I was like, what for 200 cars? Are you people out of your mind? And then different shocks, different springs. And I think it's like plus 5% spring rate front plus 30 rear. And you know what uh, that means? That means that the back is going to be assier, assier, and then they ruined that. That didn't ruin that. But then they they, uh, they mitigated that, that mitigated yeah. that with Cup Two tires. So uh, now it's got so, so, it's much, have grip. so much grip. But oh, that's an interesting choice because right. it's going to still not be that hilarious. It's going to be different. But you know, it's going to be faster. What it was exactly was I genuinely can't wait to get a Chorizo on track with like a Porsche Seven Eighteen, because I think that with those tires, that suspension, that all wheel drive system which we'll talk about in a second, um, that thing will punch so far above its weight in lap times and no one will ever drive in that way because they're going to make 200 of them. be collectible. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. Um, so what I really want is the short gear ratios. That's like 911R, right? The 911R created this thing where you were like, oh, it's going to be so exciting and thrilling and then we're not going to make enough of them so they'll always be collector's items, which is a shame because... Yeah, but then I they mean, made the GT3 GT, uh, Touring, which is effectively the same. Yes, product. that was the response. So um, I'm, I guess my natural follow-on is hopefully some of those technical bits end up in some other car that could actually get used in anger by someone appreciative. I really hope so because it. I turns, mean, are collectors buying Corollas anyway? Will yeah, people collect those cars? I think so. I think so. When you make a you know a semi homologation, so obviously the GR Yaris is a rally homologation car with a totally different body. That's not really the case for um Corolla, Corolla, but it's still cool enough that these will in twenty years we'll be seeing them on bring a trailer at quite a premium, yeah. especially the Marizo. Yeah. Um. But like that, the gears are short enough that the that the base car does. Did you drive all of these? Yeah. Uh-huh. Base car does 60 just in second gear and Cor- Cor- uh, Toyota calls it a 5.0 to 60. And then Marizo is a, f- is a 4.9 according to them, but in it only third. does 52 in second. Mm-hmm. So even though it's still is the faster, power level the same power level is the same torque. Uh, there's a torque bump also for Marizo, which is insane that they're doing two different homologation, like engine spec homologations. And, um, but I want the short gears with the, and the, and the stiffer suspension with the stiffer springs with in the four back. With, instead of cup twos. They're just basic. Uh, they're they're not four S's. They're Pilot Sport fours. Uh, so they're not quite as grip grippy as Pilot Sport four S's. Mm. Um, but uh, I think that that car would be the magic recipe. That's what I want. And yeah. you can get all that shit from Toyota. You just have to mix and match it in yeah. a way that they don't offer. You just have to buy a Chorizo and then and then put the back. Oh, and the Chorizo doesn't have a back seat, mm. which kind of oh. defeats the purpose a little bit of that. It's a not five def- door. Yeah. Wait, so the back doors go nowhere, yeah, like an a, Alpha GTA M. They, I mean, they open, and there you have like extra structural bracing. Oh, it's a perfect Costco car. I guess there's a shelf there, but you know what you can do in the regular car: fold the seats down and put it in the trunk. Mm. It's kind of a strange decision, I think. Yeah, I but, mean, to, they have to differentiate technically the Morizo, I suppose. But it's a shame that you can't get the good stuff in a more usable package yeah. that's not as collectible so that it could actually just be like the ideal daily driver. Right. And so I'm giving it a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm highlighting all the negatives. I should say you start the thing and it feels and sounds special right away because the whole car buzzes from that mm-hmm. three cylinder. Yeah. Um, and like I two, love three cylinders. Two, yeah. Oh, you your K car episode is now live. Yep. So you get that as plenty of three cylinder noises from yeah. there. Go to the end of that video and watch the Honda beat. Unfortunately, it sounds nothing like the Honda Beat. Um, yeah, because it's not naturally aspirated. And, I think and it doesn't have mufflers. ITVs. Right. It's got it's still got mufflers on it. And so between like two, two, two and 3,000 RPM, the Corolla is deafening. 
It's got this unbelievable. Oh, boom. but it's like a like lugging kind of like. I mean, it sounds cool, but I mean, I it genuinely vibrates the whole car. So like the whole car gets excited, and then revs get higher, and it sounds okay. I would chop the muffler off in a second and deal with whatever boom happens because I know there's a screaming monster in there somewhere. Yeah, I had a three cylinder motorbike and I did that with it and mm-hmm. it was really great. Yeah, triples are cool. Yeah. And then so they have this all wheel drive system that you can, it's basically a slightly overdriven rear axle in the same way that Focus, Focus RS, RS was. Yeah. Um, 0.7% overdrive. Um, and so the three modes that you can select are 50 50, uh, 60 front, 40 rear, and then. 30 front 70 rear mm. um but that's like that. still not enough no. what yeah on the track so the the two basic modes the sort of two more front biased modes uh come into a corner and add power and it'll just push it'll add push the 30 70 mode doesn't really add push but it doesn't help rotate either it just kind of stays neutral at best best case it's just not enough power to overwhelm the rear wheels mm. so you wind up just accelerating out of the corner which then brings you to the to the limit sooner which is an understeer limit and that's it mm. so it is a single under power it's definitely a on on grippy surface it's definitely a resolute understeer you can flick it in and it trail breaks so beautifully just kind of comes around on the way in and so you can get it to rotate on the way in and smack it and, and then it straightens out immediately as soon as you're on the power yeah, yeah. and 37 it doesn't you know, 30 70 it doesn't like fall into understeer it but it doesn't it's not going to help you gain additional rotation it'll hold where you are um, hell of a fucking car to what to kind learn of handbrake on. does it have a manual handbrake that okay. disconnects the rear axle so you it, the second oh. you pull it it disconnects the clutch so that you can lock up the rears without disturbing the whole car and it does work really yeah okay that's uh, not nothing. I think this. So the, here's the. I'm lukewarm on this car because I'm like, yeah, man, did it be a crazy, you, yeah, crazy you want it to be more insane. But I have a feeling once I get it on dirt or wet or somewhere gravel, it's going to be mind blowingly good. Uh, and so against what else you could buy, right? Because w- what you're doing is comparing it against an ideal type of saying, if you had your ideal car, it would do the X, Y, or Z. What else can you buy that? kind of approaches this right if you're buying a supra for example then you get a different set of of characteristics altogether compromises too yeah yeah uh really it's integra and sorry different leagues of performance uh civic type r which is not out yet there's a new one coming in a couple months um wrx which is not what it used to be uh so that's kind of out i think it's really Unfortunately, Veloster N has been replaced with Elantra, Elantra N, which is a sedan, so kind of a different thing. You really what is the character of that car though? Elantra N, mm-hmm. fucking great. Yeah, genuine. You get in it. This is an Albert. This is I don't know who did it, but it reeks of Albert Biermann. And Biermann was uh, the guy who did all of the golden era M cars: E46 M3, um, E39 M5. He's E90s. He's he's the man who made BMWs feel the way they do. Uh, and obviously, Hyundai hired him to run N. He's now retired. He just retired. Uh, but Elantra N feels just like uh, Veloster Luster N, which was a riot. I mean, sharp, razor edged, focused, great seats, unbelievable noises coming from the engine, pops and fizzes and. Um, just an absolute monster of a hot hatch. And now it's a hot sedan. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Veloster, so Elantra N. So that and, sounds like a real candidate mm-hmm. for jollies yeah. against the Corolla GR. Yep. And of course, Civic Type R. And then um, Golf R. But Golf R is same size-ish as the Corolla, but, you know, bigger on the inside. Not more mature looking interior with nicer pieces, but then you can't use it because everything's, capacitive touch and as you're driving you turn on heated steering wheels and take it out of you know whatever performance mode you put it in is a nightmare to deal with so yeah and we've already discussed the seriousness of its character which mm-hmm. to me discounts it immediately except i you've not driven mark 8 golf R yet i have not no. me neither but th- that thing does do drifts all day because that really? does yeah so it's got how does it it's got a 50 50 all-wheel drive system so the the problem is it still haldex it's it's no longer Haldex branded. I, I, so I think it's a different supplier. It's probably GCAN, which is the one, the company that did um, Focus RS. I don't know who did it. But it's at the end of the day, the, the big problem with all front wheel drive transverse um, hot hatches when you add all wheel drive is they can't decouple the front axle. So no matter what you do, some proportion, i.e. most of the power is going to go to the front wheels. 
um, golf can only do as it did with Haldex, 50%. So it can lock front and rear axles together, which means basically 50-50 split. This is happening at the center diff. It's happening at the center diff. It's a it's actually a clutch pack that engages. So when the clutch is released, it's front wheel drive. And the, the more the clutch pack clamps down, the, more percentage the closer it gets to 50-50. Um, and 50 50 is max, right? I mean, obviously, the front wheels are off the ground and the rears are, are you know, the only thing touching the ground, then it's 0 100, but really it's 50 50. The golf, the Mark 8 Golf R's party trick is that it can, that can send 100% of the power that makes it to the back to one wheel or the other. So, so it can, you can use it to help rotate the car. Yeah. And so we've all seen the drifts on the video. Dry, dry pavement is not a problem. It will go, you know, 10 or 20 degrees sideways and hold a drift. Hmm. So I need That's to get a good time to be alive. Yeah. It's a good time to have an all wheel drive hot hatch that can finally drift because even Fo- Focus RS couldn't do that. That also had torque vectoring at the back, but in, in real torque vectoring at the back. So it could actually put more than 50% to one wheel and still couldn't really drift. In spite um, of the drift mode. Right, in spite of the drift mode. I mean, it would do it for a couple seconds then overheat. <laughs> But yeah, so I mean, I th- Golf R is really Corolla's main competitor, and it's so serious that I was ho- hoping Corolla would be like lean into the bat shittery, mm-hmm. bat shittery. Nice, mm-hmm. nice word, yeah. And doesn't yet, but I have a feeling the first time I drove it, drive it on wet, I will uh, discover. I'll discover. Also, uh, get it on a good back road. Yeah, because that's a real world situation where the car really distinguishes itself and is like the ideal use case for that car. And that's where you don't want to necessarily be sideways on a back road. You just want to rock it out of a corner without adding understeer. And that yes, 37 exactly. mode does that. So that's what Yaris was like. Yeah, effectively. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was not going to go sideways, but it was just really agile, rotated beautifully. And it just was like a device where I, it did exactly what I wanted it to do. It felt seamless. And there was never like I was wrestling with the car in decently quick uh Good size, you know, it's it's nice and compact. It's everything. It, to me, I was like, oh, this is a place finally where I'm like, I don't know that the, the like, because I always worry about the end of my GTI. Like, what am I going to do after the GTI? Now that the Mark 8 is existing and it's so, you know, deficient compared to the Mark 7 right. in, in certain ways. I'm always thinking, what, what would be next? This, so, could, this could be it. I, I really, I cannot wait to get that car not on a racetrack. I really, I think on a back road, it's going to be incredible. You know what it reminded me of more than anything else? It's another four wheel drive homologation. Integrale? Yeah. Really? Yeah. So the thing about. Well, I don't know why I guessed that. So, well, think about it. I mean, it's a hot hatch with four wheel drive flared fenders um, and a hot turbo motor. And four doors. Mm-hmm. And Yeah dynamically or more just spiritually spiritually so dynamically delta integrale reminds me more of wrx sdi than anything else um where the engine Old is school just, turbo four cylinder engines is kind of a non event doesn't really sound like much yeah. to delta um but it you know and it's laggy as hell the wrx sounds like much well you always hear them without exhaust systems right not from the factory they don't yeah. i mean from the factory they just mm. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, they, they, so the engine is smooth, so you don't hear it, you don't feel it, um, and the car just explodes out of corners and goes wherever you want to at whatever rate of speed. But it's not fun. Um, GR Corolla on track reminded me of that. Like it's absolutely, re- especially with Marito, unbelievable amount of pace, but so forgiving that it's actually a little bit less exciting than I want to do. And LDI was the same way. Because you just didn't uh, didn't feel like you were on the edge, on the ragged edge. It wasn't it wasn't maniacal enough. Did you? I mean, you've driven Delta Negralis, right? Mm-hmm. All of them. Like, uh, like yeah, uh, yeah. And same not thing. an eight valve. I've never driven an eight valve. They're same, only slower and yeah. smoother, and much smoother. Really? Yeah, that engine with eight valves is just for whatever reason. The eight valve to two valve per cylinder cars uh, engines tend to be smoother in their sound and power delivery than fours. Um, it could be, it could actually just be that they're all lower compression because they're mostly a lower state of tune. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Delta's eight, uh, eight valve was even more tractable and less spicy than the 16 valves. Mm-hmm. Um, but to me, the car was just like, it will go exactly where it's pointed. It will never step out sideways. Yeah. Never piss me off. Rides 
okay. I mean, the ones, half the ones that I've driven have been very modified. Yes. You're um, thinking of the red one. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the red one's red very one. stiffly sprung. Yeah. Um, but you could do ridiculous things and it never, there was never a, a, a second of counter steer. There was nothing. Correct. Yeah. It's a car that you would, um, just leave supercars for dead. Right. In, which is its own kind of amusement. That was exactly where I was going to go next. What, when you're looking for, so you have GTI, you have Mark seven, you love it because it's a good capable all rounder. Yeah. And it's fun. It, it Sometimes when I'm out driving around, there comes a corner in the course of my regular driving that requires dispatching, and the car is happy to do that. And when I was daily driving an E-Class wagon, you know, that wasn't an option. And the GTI to have, be able to sort of just pull that off when you need, and that's, I mean, I also in the past have daily driven 911s. So having the option to do that at all times, I get a lot of value out of. Right. And some people, you know, are like, I daily drive a truck, and I'm like, mm, that sucks <laughs> for you i mean i get it it's practical you need to have a truck and it also has to function on a daily basis but i really like having the ability at all times to you know hike up your skirt and go exactly and so the gti does a great job of that and you know if what if i'm going on a drive with friends and you know the gti is the car that i have at home and or the other cars in the shop or whatever i'm just like yeah, i'll take the gti it'll be fine mm -hmm. uh, and i really enjoy driving that car at 10 and 11 tenths for sure but you had to do mods to make it more correct. Yeah, but, but fortunately not too invasive. I mean, rear sway bar and tires got got the the balance where I wanted it to be. And then, well, and then I put a tune on it because I don't know because turbos are cheating and it's too easy not to cheat. Exactly. I mean, it was like cheat. four or five hundred dollars to add at least fifty horsepower, yeah. and then I had to upgrade the clutch because of the tune. Uh, and then that's it, right? Dog, dog bone. Oh yes, is an also mount, true. Engine right? mount because those cars. This is, but I mean, I'm I've stopped. I'm not doing any more. I mean, I've watched so many people do this with modifying cars, and I had a conversation because on the rally I had a 190e, and someone was talking about how there, some wheel that looks like the gully deckle but is 18 inches and modular, and I was like, why do you do this dumb shit? You know, that I would never do that. Not you. I meant why does one? <laughs> well. The older I get, the more I'm like, modifying the hell out of a car is not fun because you you it's in a delicate equilibrium and you start fucking stuff up. And it's so easy to do stuff in a way where the primary benefits of that car, whether it's the ability to fly over speed bumps. That's why I don't want to lower my GTI. I don't want to put coilovers on. I don't want to do any of that. I like being able to just fly over speed bumps. And like it's the purpose of having a hot hatch is lots of suspension travel and never scraping the front and rear and all that good stuff, you know. In a supercar, you have to think about all that stuff. You have to, oh, I got to put up the axle lift if it has it, or, you know, you have to replace the front spoiler. And, and just you just you have to be aware when you're yeah, driving. Yeah, exactly. You're constantly scanning the road exactly. for anything. And it's stressful. And there's something really wonderful about not having to do that. And so when people start really modifying the hell out of stuff to make it undrivable, I'm just like, I don't know. I, I, did, I was tempted in the past and have done some stuff in that direction. And the old, as I get older and more experienced, I'm just like, oh, there's no appeal in doing that anymore it ruins the primary benefit of that car i mean depending on what you're using i mean if you're exactly. going to track it exclusively then yeah you got to do all that yeah, stuff. but then if you're going to track it exclusively why would you have something that's like a gti exactly doesn't you know exactly buy the right unless it was fifty five hundred dollars because we know someone with a mark 5 rabbit gti track car and you're like that's fifty five hundred dollars and it's an absolute riot for fifty five hundred dollars that's an absolute it's cheaper than an na because na miatas are so expensive now that track track days on the cheap well, to buy. <laughs> and that thing would be an absolute riot for $15,500. I yeah. mean, but that is, you know, a purpose-built race car that I'll, I don't, I, he probably could daily it, but yeah, that'd be you a, could, but it's a little a bit aggressive for that. Right. You could. The problem that I found with modifying cars is you're kicking the can of failure down the road. So uh, I just drove, well, <laughs> that's quite the graphic. <laughs> well, I just drove a E39 M5 with a, um, like a multi-puck clutch, like a carbon clutch. Um, and Ugh, well, I already hate it. It wasn't done by the owner. The owner is Straighten from M539 Restorations, who we'll talk oh, yes. about next week uh, mm -hmm. because he is a fucking god among men. Um, and uh, I, I drove it and it's fine. It's not as good as the stock clutch. Someone else did it and he's he'll leave it in there until it fails. But it does slip occasionally. And he was, you know, he was saying like, yeah, I can. What's the point of uh, an aggressive clutch if it doesn't hold the power? This is the lesson that I learned. So I once put a five puck kevlar clutch in the Scirocco, and it was 
light switch on off. And every year that I, when I had to like do a a missions testing on it, I had to drive it in because they could just stall it. And I would tell them you have three stalls after the third stall. I'll drive it in. Cause they, you know, they're like, you can't drive a car in here and they couldn't figure it out. But once it was fine until it started slipping. And that's what's the benefit. Well, the problem, the benefit is these are race clutches. They're not meant to exist anywhere between fully in or fully out. So they need a heavier, this is, I'm not, everyone can argue this, but in general, they need a heavier pressure plate. So it started slipping. So I put a heavier pressure plate in and then I broke the release plate, which on a Volkswagen. Oh is yes. You're talking about, plate. you're talking about snowballing right. where you and just then push I broke, the failure to a, the next weakest exactly. component. Once the release plate, I put a reinforced release plate in, I broke the clutch push rod. Then I snapped the clutch, clutch cable. And then it just became this cascading shit show of broken parts. And I went right back to the stock clutch with stock, everything else. And it hasn't broken since. Yes. And so I think the mods that you've done on your GTI have been, are the right things to do, but you saw right off the bat, you're, you tune it and what, 8,000 miles later, not even your no, clutch is gone. Not even, it was like three or 4,000 miles. Yeah. That's a fucking problem, dude. And the clutches are known on right. those cars to not be up to really increased power. Yeah. Which is not, I don't think I would tune it. Yeah. That's, so, so backstory, my brother crashed the GTI that he, the GT three that he and I jointly owned and he felt bad. And so he paid for the tune. On my, G, on my GTI oh. when it went into the shop for the rear sway bar. Now we learn it was a free tune. It was a free <laughs> tune, yes. <laughs> it was a free tune. Um, uh, but then it ended up costing you $2,000 cl- right. of clutch. Yeah. Um, GTI, I would probably... And now it's very fast and I do appreciate it mm-hmm. and the clutch is now usable and I don't think there's going to be any other failure points lurking. Really? Fingers crossed. I mean, I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. I but mean, I the car seems to be in equilibrium right, right now in the sense that I've added 5,000 miles and nothing has broken. It's not a lot of I miles. Know, I know, I know. <laughs> but my point still stands. You did the right mods, right? I mean, you're stopping. You're not going to slam the car to the ground. You're not going to no. do all that other stuff. But you still had to do things to give that car more personality. Yes. And actually the dog bone insert. So that was a 034 Motorsports. It's just an, it's not a mount. It's just the insert you did? Yes. It's okay. a little metal insert that replaces the rubber in the standard Dog what bone. a difference. So you start that car. So you had stalled it a couple times, right? When I first uh, got it? Yeah. E- so the GTI, you can't feel the engine running at idle. Yes. So you were, you can, you can admit this on camera. I'm yeah. yeah. Tell the story no, 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 no. I mean, I, I definitely popped the clutch when it was in gear because I didn't realize it was running. Because <laughs> I'm used to engines that just make all this noise and stuff. I'm not used to modern cars. <laughs> so, yeah, I thought it was in neutral and it wasn't, <laughs> or I thought it was off and yeah. it was on. Yeah. <laughs> So. But that's a problem in a hot hatch. This yeah, is where the Germans go too far. And this is where like Golf R and GTI just went too far. It's one of the biggest differentiators uh, of last that's gen. That's not a stall. That's a stall. Is that a stall? That's, it could have been a murder if there was someone yes, in front of your but car. not a stall. Okay, fine. It's a it's attempted murder. Uh, of any pedestrians, but yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, that's the, the, one of the biggest differentiators between last gen Civic SI and Civic Type R. So SI, you'd start and you'd watch the tack go, and that was it. And you never felt the engine again. And Type R, the whole cabin buzzed. Yeah. So I appreciate that on Corolla GR that you can feel the vibrations from the engine. I think that's so important. Um, so mm-hmm. here's the thing: is if, you, if I bought a Golf R over a Corolla, I know I'd have to do mounts or a mount or a mount insert or something. Because yes, just to conduct some of the uh, vibration from the powertrain into right. the car. Because all these cars are too isolated. You know they're. I mean, you're coming from judging everything by the standard of these Mark I Volkswagens, which no. are... I mean, look, I still have two Mark I Volkswagens, but if any modern car vibrated like that, it would be, I mean... A warranty would, claim. It would, wouldn't be a warranty claim. It would be a class action lawsuit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't expect that, but I do expect in a car that exists for the purpose of fun. But in, in terms of speaking about what you consider to be like a, a, a desirable outcome right. is, are those Volkswagens. Uh, and so your standards are different from the average consumers. I don't think they are. I don't th- I look, I don't expect modern cars to f- feel that way, but I expect to at least be able to feel the engine. So in a, in a hot hatch, like a civic SI, I know I want that. I want the engine mounts that are in the, the civic type R. I want to feel like the thing is alive. You don't have all that many touch points in a car, right? You have the steering wheel, you have your ass, you have the pedals and you know, a shifter and that's it. And if you never feel anything coming through any of it, What's the point of having a fun car, right? Of an enthusiast car. Right. So you have, yeah. you know, electric power steering that's dead. Corolla steering is dead on track. Um, and so, right, that's 
taken that out and you know in your ass you're going to feel obviously ride quality and vibration nvh from the from the and road, rotation which it doesn't do mm-hmm. easily i mean it does you can get it you can get a camry sideways so i think it's really important that you know the car companies give you acoustic feedback and you know vibrations and other fizzes and stuff and sure. to bring it back delta didn't launch a delta negrali was just kind of a numb experience and so is corolla gr yeah, I mean, in the Integrale, if it has an exhaust system, you hear the engine, but you don't feel it very much. Right. And off boost, it feels like a economy car. Yeah. So at least Corolla, you know, isolating though the rest of the car is, at least you feel vibrations or whatever. I need. Okay, so Elantra N versus. I mean, I haven't driven Elantra N all that much, but I've I spent a lot of time in Veloster, and I never stopped laughing. I'm so annoyed that this car is now out of production before I got a chance to do an Icons episode on it because it's the best GTI. Volkswagen, everyone at Volkswagen who works on the GTI should own a, a, or at least spend a month with a, 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 a Lost Lost N because it was everything that the, every place that the GTI missed the mark, the N just nailed it. I wish I liked looking at them. That's the problem. So if That's you compare, why the I-30N, we talk about right. this often, why the I-30N that doesn't come to here is but the answer if you even but if you just compare i30n or or i30 or veloster to golf base base cars or you know or veloster to Scirocco that was on sale in europe the volkswagens are so much better of a car much nicer interior better packaging better refinement all of all across the board um, but when you step up to the you know veloster n versus gti level what's more important to me is the experience and that's where hyundai just got that so right I would really like to try some of the hot uh, Renaults because apparently the Renault, the hot Renaults are like nuts like this, and that to me is really interesting. But unfortunately, I've never interacted. Have I ever driven a Renault? I mean, I drove an R five Turbo. Yeah, that was it's fucking insane. I mean, there's yeah. no, I could not stop. But the like modern uh, RS Clio RS or whatever, I don't even know anything about them because they're so remote from my experience mm-hmm. in the United States. But I hear that they're just like that they have that level of character that is missing from the Volkswagens. I also heard, you know, the golf, the club sport uh, GTI was supposed to be amazing in that axis also. Is it? I, yeah. It is I mean, supposed to be just epically good. I, I wonder who does the, like who does GTI? Like what person sits down and is like, I don't want to feel any vibration from the engine ever. They're thinking about selling large volumes of them. I mean, now, especially in the United States, it's the only golf you can buy. And so it has to, it necessarily has to be forced into a more mainstream product. Although I think the refinement level of the Mark 7 GTI was sufficient for any consumer. Anyway. It was sufficient for a Mercedes consumer. Yes. That was the thing. It was too, it's too refined. It's why I have an e-golf and not a GTI. Because if I'm going to have that refined of an experience, I might as well have an electric car. I mean, if it, if Mark 5 drove like, uh, I'm sorry, if Mark 7 drove like Mark 5 did, I would have a Mark 7 GTI and not an e-golf. Yeah, because it has the uh, hydraulic, electro-hydraulic steering. It's just fizzy and fun and talkative and silly and, you know, all of the things that Mark 7 isn't. And 8 just took another step in the direction of isolation. Yeah. Um, you know, and then you get the, the, the drawback to all that soft engine mount stuff is wheel hop. Yes. Right? So then when you're saying, well, it's got to appeal to all these different people. Well, why should I have to put different engine mounts in my GTI just to be able to launch the thing or just leave a red light quickly yeah. without it. It's yeah. Just, yeah. It's yeah. Bad design. A bad um, compromise is baked in. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the takeaway is that uh, Corolla GR on a good road. I'm I very interested. I would love to get a press loan for one of those actually. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. I know. I'm trying Everybody to. Everybody just wants one of those. Know. And you're, and you, are you going to try and do an icon? Zone? I am trying everything I can to do an icons. We're working on scheduling uh, I'm right now. I'm interested to know what else you pair it with to tell the story of that car. Well, we've discussed basically the Integrale. Yeah. yeah. Now you can't get a Yaris. Although I did see a Yaris, uh, Mexican plated Yaris floating around in the U.S. Okay. Do you know who it belongs <laughs> no, to? No, I don't. Damn I it. just I know that someone spotted one. All right. If anyone knows of a Yaris in the U.S., let me know. Yeah, Yaris GR. Say something in the comments. Yeah, someone's going to show up with a regular old, a regular ass Yaris. Yes, a GR Yaris. Let me make this very clear. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really want like a 1.1 liter gray market import Yaris from, from Yugoslavia or something. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, interesting. GR Corolla is great. I think I'm so pleased with Toyota that they listened to the enthusiasts. Yeah, when that car, I don't pay attention to new cars. When they announced that that car was existing and coming here, I was like, holy shit. And I got like excited about a new car which happens to me every three years, mm-hmm. maybe. 
Uh, so, I mean, I'm delighted that it's here, and it sounds like it's, you know, a real contender for top one, two, three slots of enjoyable hatchback cars. There's nothing else. Yeah. There's nothing else. And, you know, despite the, the handling foibles, I have a feeling look, you, you're never going to get What if you put shit or, tires on it? I think it would be so much better. Mm. I mean, this is, this is this is this is the problem. So you know, when you were listening to the chief engineer and he was talking about capability and he was talking about speed and he was talking about you know wholeness of of the whole chassis and I'm like, fuck that! I want to be sideways. Like, I want to be stupid. So put all seasons on it. No seasons. I put winters on it. <laughs> I mean, that would I think that car would really wake up. Maybe I should do that for the icons video. Toyota better not be listening to this. No, you, that's an interesting idea, right? Do it with both in both configurations and then do it as an amusement quotient. Yeah. Rather than as a like lap time, right? I'll which one? Chorizo, in which way do right. you, makes you happier? Which one makes you laugh more? I'll get the chorizo edition and put Blizzax on it. Yeah. That'd be fun. All yeah. right, there, there's the plan. See if I can slide it around, you know, normal stri- in normal streets. Unfortunately, they last for 16 minutes Doesn't because matter. they're such soft tires for for snow. Yeah. Function. As long as it's not over like 70 degrees, <laughs> they'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, they're just going to turn into puddles. Yeah, <laughs> puddles of melted rubber. Yeah. I'm fine with that. Um, but thank God we have a hot hatch. I'm so yeah. excited about this. Yeah. Can't wait to drive that more. But uh, yeah. So next time you run into the owner of a Yaris GR, uh, tell them with Mexico please, license plates, please, please have them bring it to us. And so I'll, and I'll promise I'll get a GR Corolla one way or another and we'll get them together. Cause I think yeah. that would be really interesting. The, the Otherwise you may go. Yeah. I mean, as there, is there ever any photo of those two cars together? Because there's no markets where both are available. Correct. Yeah. Mm. That'd be the really interesting. I mean, GR Yaris was a, is a homologation car. So it's automatically one rung more special. Yes. But the fact that this was, is the same engine and whatever is, can you believe Toyota did this? Yeah. I mean, cause they're not the, I mean, they periodically have highlights moments of, um, brilliance in brill enthusiast, brilliance mm-hmm. breaking through. And then just a vast sea of here's a Mirai. Here's another Mirai <laughs> that we built in the factory where the LFA was made right. because we had this factory that knows how to make carbon fiber. Mm-hmm. So, We'll make the Mirai in it. And you're just like, <laughs> so sad. But yeah. yes, it's, it's it's a little bit out of character, but it breaks through every so often. Yeah. And this is the only of the three R products is the only the three GR products is the only one that's actually a Toyota. I mean, the GR Super is 100% BMW. The GR 86, which is still my favorite of the, of the three is, you know, predominantly Subaru. So this is a real Toyota. Um, I love what you do for me. Oh, yeah. Is there, it's like the photo with the people jumping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This um, has been episode 68. I can't count that high. I think so. Of um, the Carmudgeon Show. Uh, join us next week. We're, we're going to talk about our Euro- European adventure. Yes. We're both jet lagged. Misadventure. Misadventure. Come on. It wasn't that bad. Um, <laughs> cliffhanger. All right. Until next week.